Thank you, and thank you for taking the time to sit with us and hopefully learn a little bit about uh, employee engagement and, in particular, compensation's impact on it. What I want to do today is introduce myself, Sean Fitzpatrick, but more importantly introduce Norm Bailey David, who will be leading the discussion today. Uh, I'm going to spend just one or two minutes giving you a bit of review of who Talamap is. I know there's a number of clients on the phone today and on the webinar that know us, but there's also some people who may not have had the opportunity to learn about Telemap. So I will spend one minute or two minutes talking about our company, and then I will turn it over to Norm, who will spend some time talking about compensation as an engagement driver, and then also looking at improving engagement using compensation. So I'll give you 30 minutes of an overview on that, and then we'll spend a little bit of time at the end on wrap-up and questions. Just a little bit of background about Telemap before I introduce Norm. Uh, Telemap's been in this business of employee engagement for well over 15 years, and it's our core focus. It's all we do. We don't do a range of other activities. It's the core thing that we do is help our clients measure, benchmark, and improve employee engagement. And we focus primarily on Canadian and U.S based organizations in the knowledge-based sector, but that covers a wide range of industries. On the next slide, we'll just give you a bit of a sense of the types of organizations that we work with, anything from technology and engineering to not-for-profit, to healthcare, financial services, and a range of other sectors and industries. I think it's also important to point out that we've had the chance to work in the back end on collecting Canada's top 100 employer data uh, for the last five or six years. And that's allowed us to see not only what we hear about engagement from our employee, from our organizations that we have a chance to work with, but also what some of the top employers are scoring and looking at around best practices on employee engagement. Needless to say, it gives us a very good overview on the state of engagement and the things that impact engagement one of which is compensation. And that's where I want to turn over and introduce you to Norm Bailey David today. And just to give you a bit of background on Norm, Norm leads the consulting practice at Talent Map. But more importantly, Norm has over 25 years of survey research experience, employee engagement experience, and, and dealing with organizational development experience. So he's had a lot of background in this area and hopefully can shed some light on some of the things that he's learned along the way. Prior to, to Norm joining Telemap, he had worked with some large research and management consulting firms. Um, PricewaterhouseCoopers might be one that you recognize. He's also had the chance to moderate thousands of focus groups. So he's had the chance to sit in in close proximity with thousands of employees and customers around the issues that drive organizational success. He's also monitored and facilitated over 500 management workshops. So not only has he seen it from the employee side, he's also seen it from the management side. So Norm brings a, a real breadth of experience uh, to Telemap and also hopefully to those participants on the webinar uh, today. He'll be able to bring some ideas and creative approaches to what he's seeing out there in the marketplace. Norm, I'll turn it over to you now. Thanks a lot, Sean. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, everyone, depending on uh, where in this fine continent of North America you're sitting. Hopefully your weather is better than our weather here uh, in the east. So uh, I'm going to get right into it. Um, I chose this topic of compensation because increasingly we're we're seeing a lot of uh, questions and confusion asked from our clients in terms of compensation's role uh, in, in employee engagement. There's a lot of myths out there. There's a lot of uh, ways, of practices, and ways of doing things. Uh, and we decided to look deep into our benchmark database, uh, almost 200,000 respondents uh, in the most recent count, more than 600 different uh, surveys, just to see um, to look at really what's the real story in terms of how important is the role of compensation in engaging employees, and then more importantly, 
once we have a, a good idea of really how important it is or it isn't, then let's decompose it and let's figure out what we need to do about compensation to make sure that we're getting the maximum value of our compensation dollar for employee engagement. Now, first of all, I'll preface uh, the webinar right away by saying I'm not a compensation and benefits expert. Uh, there are plenty of other uh, people, organizations that specialize in the, you know, in the calculation and the, the, def the definition of comp and benefit plans. That's not what we're here to talk about today. What really we want to talk about is the double-edged sword of compensation and how important it is in terms of driving engage and engaging your employees. And of course, there's a, there's a downside to that in terms of how compensation may or may not be harmful to employee engagement. So I'm going to get right into that now. Okay. The first uh, slide you see in front of you is really, a, we, uh, we can take any one of a number of client uh, survey responses and you're always going to see something that looks very much like this. When we look at all of the drivers, all the dimensions that drive uh, employee engagement run from environment, division, senior leadership, and immediate management, and the list goes on, uh, typically, and uh, very typically, we always see compensation being uh, right down at the bottom of the list. It's, it's the engagement whipping boy, if, uh, if you want to use that analogy. And there's a number of reasons for that when we dig deep. Um, the first reason is actually uh, a survey response mechanism. It's part of, part of the social learning of, kind of conducting surveys. But no matter how much we uh, assure respondents that their information is kept confidential, that it's anonymous, uh, and they believe that, they have no problem with that because our high response rates and the candid nature of the comments that we receive uh, surely indicate that uh, their confidence in, in their anonymity. Nonetheless, uh, respondents like uh, or feel that if they uh, rate compensation highly that they're going to be, uh, for whatever reason, they're going to be uh, closing themselves out of opportunities for higher compensation in the future. It sounds silly, but it's actually true when we debrief a lot of our respondents in terms of why uh, or what's wrong with compensation. They said not really anything. It's just that we don't want to make, we want to make sure that the company or the organization understands that we still want higher compensation. And that's a natural tendency. So there's that, that overall uh, survey response mechanism built in. And that's typically why compensation ends up at the bottom of the list. The key now here is to understand, OK, well, that's be that becomes a squeaky wheel. Uh, does it merit the grease? And that's what we're going to hear uh, a little bit more today. So let's dig deeper into some of the data. So when we look at all of the drivers, and we run uh, countless statistical analyses, here's the example of uh, just a simple multiple regression uh, of uh, all of our drivers in terms of how important they are with uh, engagement being a dependent variable and all these drivers being the independents. We see compensation comes out probably around the middle. Uh, vision, growth, and leadership uh, are things we typically see at the top of the list. And when we look at all of our data, those are the key uh, drivers of engagement. Um, and compensation is down there number four, uh, and probably about one quarter uh, the level of importance of something like vision or professional growth. Um, and what is that telling us? Well, that telling that when we look at the data, it, that's telling us that where we see, uh, we don't see necessarily positive correlation with compensation, and that fits with our intuitive understanding of, of what compensation does. In other words, we don't see if we, if, if where there's higher compensation, there's higher engagement. That we don't see. But what we do see is when there's less satisfaction or um, typically a lot uh, lower uh, satisfaction or engagement around compensation, then that tends to drive engagement lower. So it almost sounds counterintuitive, but uh, we need to understand and decompose compensation to understand the dynamics behind that. Here's a chart, really, that puts compensation in, uh, in relative terms with all the other drivers. And we see it's off to the left. The right side of this is really the strong engagement drivers. The left side is the weak engagement drivers. And we see the hygiene or the satisfiers tend to be on the left. Compensation fits squarely in that space. Uh, so 
and this is really consistent with all the research, and I'm sure if you work in the HR or compensation and benefits field, it's probably consistent with your experience as well. We, we, we tend not to think that compensation or higher compensation correlates with higher engagement, and this, this analysis would bear that out. All right, so let's see now. If uh, we're making you think here that compensation doesn't affect engagement, well, we got, we're going to have to think again here because when we dig deeper and we start to deconstruct compensation for its component parts, then we're going we're, we're, we're to see that compensation actually plays uh, a somewhat important role, as we saw in our regression analysis previously. So let's start taking a look. Well, when we look, we tend to look at all of the, uh, the individual drivers um, as building blocks. Uh, some of you may be aware of the uh, psychological construct of Maslow, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And we, when we look at the different drivers of engagement, uh, ranging from innovation, brand, customer focus, work-life balance, professional growth, uh, management and leadership, et cetera, we see compensation tends to um, sort of form one of the, the bottom pillars. It really forms a foundation. So what happens when you weaken the foundation of any, of any building or any construct? It, ten, it tends to weaken the rest. And just like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if the first level needs aren't satisfied, the, the rest, the remaining needs don't necessarily uh, come into play. So in other words, the compensation is, for whatever reason, uh, out of whack, or for employees perceive it as such, then it obviously becomes a much more important consideration. And that's what we're going to look at here. So let's deconstruct it. Uh, I think we need, we need to, uh, to understand compensation, we need, to, we need to really deconstruct compensation into its component parts. And the way we do this is we look at extrinsic and versus intrinsic motivators. Uh, and starting with uh, a series of needs of our employees, and we can break them down into sort of three categories. Um, the functional needs, the first thing is people need to get paid because they, they have to pay for the necessities of life. These are functional needs, they have to be met, uh, and they're the first order. But then compensation also uh, plays a role in terms of peer group identification, social standing, class, lifestyle. If one makes a certain comp level of compensation, then we can identify with a certain social standing, a certain class, a certain lifestyle. Now, keep in mind this is uh, a social need, an individual social need. So let's say I'm making $100,000 a year. That says something about my social standing, but nobody else necessarily uh, is affected by that. The third level, and this is where it gets uh, interesting, is really about the feeling employee, looking for what the compensation says about me and my personality. Um, and those emotive needs are quite different uh, from the functional and the social needs. And when we start to see how compensation applies to each of these levels of needs, we start to see how we can play with the different levels and where we shouldn't play uh, as well in terms of using compensation or understanding compensation and its role in engagement. Um, I want to spend some time now looking at uh, certain compensation mechanisms because everybody understands base pay and the role of base pay and that really base pay should match with the functional needs and I'll get into competitiveness a little bit later but really when we're looking at uh, using compensation as a tool to drive motivation or to motivate employees or to engage employees, really we're talking about performance-based compensation. Uh, and this is typically the extrinsic monetary reward. So we're all familiar with the, the, the key uh, PBCs or performance-based compensation mechanisms that are out there, merit-based pay, commissions, of course, for salespeople, executive in incentive plans, long-term incentive plans, and the list goes on. So there's a whole range uh, of packages out there um, that really are used uh, to drive employee behaviors, um, to really to, uh, to motivate, to drive employee behavior. And all, uh, of course, uh, underneath that is an attempt to engage, uh, to make the employee uh, more motivated to perform more. Um, Performance-based compensation has been around long enough, at least uh, two generations or so, so that they've become, a, they've, part, they've become part of our compensation or our motivation structure and culture. 
So we necessarily start with the premise that we assume performance-based compensation schemes work. If you're looking at a, uh, motivating a salesperson, providing them a commission is a standard thing to do. It seems to work. And we, may, we go into compensation with that, with, that, uh, with that assumption. However, from an engagement perspective, that now is becoming problematic. Why do we do it? Well, it's, we've, we've developed management constructs and management approaches because it's easier to count the bottles than describe the wine. Uh, a nice quote here by Thomas Stewart, but really uh, it, it, it's a fallback in terms of uh, really attempting to quantify and to link performance with uh, our compensation mechanisms. And that's probably why it has become part of the culture. We assume it works and it's easier really to, to quantify this. However, increasing research, uh, some done by us, some done by others, uh, is showing that uh, PBC is not, uh, it doesn't necessarily work as a motivator and it can even be counterproductive. It can even cause harm. Uh, and I'm sure you can all think of examples of this where it happens. Performance-based compensation, and I'm going to come back to this towards the end of the, uh, the end of the webinar when I'm talking about really directions that you should take with regards to compensation. It can work, uh, but it's really the conditions under where it works is where there are very simple rules, a clear direction, it causes a narrowing of focus. And I can speak to one client in particular who will remain nameless. But in the research that we're doing for them, uh, in the engagement work, uh, not only research, but we're also doing a lot of uh, consulting work helping them improve engagement. They instituted a whole series of service level agreements, performance metrics, very, very quantitative approach uh, to drive performance uh, um, around a series of things, not only sales on, uh, on the sales side, but on the operations side. Uh, it has a telephone call center, so there were service levels around that. And what we found out, or what the company is finding out with us, uh, essentially, is those service level agreements and all of that performance uh, base, those performance based metrics and tie compensation that's tied to them, has really focused managers' uh, efforts on attaining those agreements, attaining those SLAs and metrics at any cost. Um, and so it's created a lot of dysfunction where employees are working to attain metrics at the expense of more common sense business practices, more engagement, more touch point with customers, et cetera, et cetera. So it's actually been counterproductive. Um, what we're seeing, Sean mentioned we do a lot of work uh, with knowledge-based industries. Uh, what we're seeing is in most cases, attempts to imp uh, implement performance-based compensation uh, has not been effective when the work requires any creativity or any rudimentary cognitive skill or any subjective uh, evaluation. In other words, where it's not a hard and fast objective metric uh, and it, the, the compensation depends on a subjective performance appraisal, for example, um, then it runs into problems and I'll explain why a little bit later. And finally, it working against those intrinsic emotional needs, the emotional needs that, uh, that I talked about before. It, of course, uh, it, with higher performance comes higher compensation base uh, or performance compensation and bonuses and, and commissions, meeting better functional needs and even social needs, but it works against the emotional side. And I'll tell you why in a little bit. So that's talking about the extrinsic side and performance-based pay. So we already see that it can be problematic from an engagement perspective. On the intrinsic side, dealing with the emotional needs, fundamentally the question becomes, what does compensation say about my value to the organization? And no longer uh, are we talking about dollars and cents here. We're talking about the messages that compensation or any compensation and benefits package say about an individual's value to their organization. And this really, there's three uh, areas that we're going to look at in detail. First is fairness and equity. Um, and I'll talk specifically about the role of fairness and equity uh, in compensation. Second, obviously, we've, we've, we've started to look at it from an extrinsic point of view. But from an intrinsic or emotional point of view, compensation uh, plays a role uh, in terms of intrinsic motivation. And I'll talk about that. And finally, the third one is recognition. Um, so each of these emotional needs um, are uh, 
essentially bundled with compensation uh, in a number of ways. So let's look at fairness, fairness and equity. And this is probably the most important one. And this is the one that gets confused the most. First of all, we have to start with the premise that most organizations em em assume employees make rational judgments around compensation because it's quantitative. In other words, uh, if it's compensation, I want more. Um, and of course, what we're seeing increasingly is in the research, behavioral economics research in particular, it's proving that human beings are not rational. We're not making rational decisions. We're making decisions uh, based on social needs. Okay, the first one here. And this is a really interesting one when we look at compensation. For employees, the value of anything is relative. In other words, no matter how well you pay uh, or compensate a certain employee for other employees, their compensation is relative to others. So even though you may be paying uh, or feel you're paying uh, and have a compensation and benefits package that's well above market, if employees do not perceive it as such, um, then it's, it's all for naught. Um, really, the, comp the level of compensation that they're provided is weighed in relation to A, their peers around them, and B, the market around the, around the organization. Second, uh, fairness trumps opportunity in social structures. In other words, it's more important that the compensation be perceived as fair than be perceived as high or, or, or have uh, growth opportunity. Really, it's all about, uh, it's all about fairness here. Um, and it's your employees that define what's normal and what's possible within your organization. And this, uh, when we contrast different industries and their approaches to compensation, we see this very, very clearly. So if we have two particular jobs, very similar jobs, let's say in administration, one working uh, on Bay Street in the finance sector, one working uh, for a not-for-profit uh, engaged in Africa and international development. What's normal uh, and what's possible are defined by the peers. In other words, a certain level of compensation is seen as fair, uh, and they do not see it necessarily as possible to have much higher than that. Whereas on the finance side, um, your employee is going to determine, rightly or not, uh, what's possible within the organization, and they base it on company and industry performance, not in terms of what the organization is necessarily willing to pay. So if there's a, if there's a state where a company is cutting back necessarily in compensation uh, in, in the finance sector, as we see quite a bit with our finance sector employees, but the industry appears to be doing well, then the fairness uh, construct comes into play and people, uh, employees, no matter how high or low their compensation, perceive it as being unfair. Uh, and that's what causes, causes problems. Finally, when we look at all of this in terms of the research on engagement, uh, we basically see that employees who believe they are paid, quote unquote, fairly, compared with people being in either their company or other companies, they're four and a half times as likely to be highly engaged as people who do not believe they're paid fairly. So whether we're talking about somebody who's paid 100,000, 200,000, or 10,000, uh, if they do not believe it based on, uh, if you know, relatively speaking, if uh, they believe that their compensation is not fair compared to their peers and compared to their industry, then they're four and a half times likely to be uh, essentially a whole. In the not not as engaged, or the, the reverse being true. If their if their compensation is per, perceived to be fair and equitable, almost five times likely to be highly engaged. And that's really where we're talking about in terms of the role of uh, of compensation and engagement. Uh, that's why we saw it not at the top of the list, but third or fourth down. The next piece uh, is really around recognition. So. This is where compensation often um, is confused with uh, satisfying the need for recognition. Recognition answers the question, the fundamental question that an employee has is, am I valued? Uh, and often, in the absence of any other information, compensation is what answers that question. So if there was, the employee is not getting recognition uh, for the contribution through other means, then they interpret their compensation level as that recognition. And of course, if they feel that um, 
that compensation is lacking or compensation doesn't mit, doesn't fit uh, their contribution and they don't feel recognized, then uh, obviously uh, the fairness uh, construct kicks in uh, and then we don't have, uh, we have issues with compensation. The problem isn't the dollar amount. The problem is whether, the problem is in this case, the, the questioning of value. Um, so often companies will uh, mistake uh, feelings of unfairness and compensation, uh, work to improve the compensation program, and then when they do the engagement survey the following year, see nothing has changed. Where the real issue actually is, is, is recognition. It's not compensation in and of itself. When we do communicate one's value through other means, and I'll get to those uh, in a few minutes, then we take compensation off the table until, of course, fairness becomes the issue. And this is where you're probably asking yourself, yeah, well, if somebody, we recognize people through other means and compensation, there comes a point where they say, yeah, no, show me the money. Uh, and that actually works. Uh, we, we have a lot of leeway before that happens. But the show me the money part is when the person uh, perceives the compensation is not a recognition issue, it's again a fairness issue, and fairness becomes the issue again. So, with all that background and understanding how we how we can deconstruct compensation into a the compensation meeting functional needs, dollars and cents part, and the compensation uh, meeting emotional needs, fairness, motivation, and recognition. Once we understand that, we can look at using compensation. Um, properly to understand how we engage employees. The first way we do this essentially is we have to deliver the basics. I'm not giving anybody a free pass, uh, in other words, to um, to underpay, I guess, is the, is the question. Because fairness is the issue. Uh, money still matters. The compensation has to be competitive in the marketplace. Fairness and equity and everything else is predicated on this. So that's the, we're, we're working with the basic assumption, uh, and you should be working with the basic assumption that if you influence your compensation policy at your organization, that it is competitive in the marketplace. Um, that's, um, that, that's a fundamental assumption going in. Now, that, of course, competitive in the marketplace means a lot of different things to a, little, a lot of different organizations, but really, fundamentally, it means uh, that an employee can go out, look out, uh, what what is you know what the compensation package is for what they do uh, in in like organizations and arrive at the conclusion that they're being uh, compensated fairly. One thing we hear a lot, um, and and this is a, this is sort of an oxymoron, but we we hear it quite a bit, uh, and we hear a considerable amount in in our not for profit clients. Uh, is I love it here, and they're really engaged, but I can't afford it. And this is where we still need to meet the functional needs, uh, the, the functional cost of living and necessities of life needs. Um, so there's an engagement there, but then if they can't afford it and the functional needs are out of whack, then there's turnover. Uh, and high turnover really cancels out high engagement. You can have the best engagement in the world, uh, the highest engagement scores, but if you're turning over your people at that quickly, there's other costs involved. What we need to do is have high engagement and low turnover. So we need to start by delivering the basics. Once we do that, assuming we have a compensation package that, uh, that we and employees uh, can compare to the marketplace, this is where we see a lot uh, of, of, of our clients and organizations slip up because there's a lot of secrecy around compensation. Um, but fundamentally, how do employees know if they're paid competitively, either within or outside the organization, unless you tell them, unless you allow them to find out? This is a communications challenge now. It's not a compensation challenge. Uh, communicate, communicate, communicate. Um, uh, we see the best results, the best practices, is when compensation surveys and other mechanisms that HR departments and senior executives are using to determine base pay to determine compensation packages. How do they do that in the marketplace? Tell your employees. Be transparent. 
when we're transparent about how these things are derived, and if we're confident that, in fact, uh, we're competitive in the marketplace, then um, they can find out for themselves. Um, and secondly, the performance appraisal process and link to compensation. Be as transparent uh, as you possibly can be. Uh, and we see that when there's transparency in the performance appraisal process, in other words, when uh, I can see how, why and how the person next to me got the raise and I didn't, and that's clear to me, then we take the fairness and equity off the table. And this is what we're doing here. We're not essentially trying to bridge the gap by playing the different, using compensation to play off different employees. We're being transparent using the same level of compensation. Uh, and people, uh, this is actually, I, I, I pulled this picture up, but it's something that I used to do routinely with my own employees. And I have this conversation with them. You're two of my best people now. I want you to go there and look for other jobs. What? And they sort of, their, their mouths would gape, gape open. What, you want me to do what? You want, yes, I want you to go out there and I want you to look for other jobs. And I want you to come back and I want you to tell me um, how fair or unfair you think you're compensated. And routinely, they would go out, come back a couple of months, and they'd say, well, you know, uh, I see you're not looking for you're not uh, you're not switching jobs and fundamentally they've looked around and they've seen yeah uh, I'm pretty I'm, I've got it pretty good here you know there's other places that might pay more um, but it's not necessarily uh, jobs that I want to take for whatever reason so they've done their own comparison facilitate that let them know where they stand and that really helps bridge the gap in terms of fairness and equity and that's really the fundamental issue it's not the dollars and cents as much as it's the, the perception of fairness. If we can communicate the perception of fairness, then uh, we've got 90% of the battle done. The third thing we need to do is really build on the foundation. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this. Um, we need to put compensation squarely back and build on that foundation. And we do that through a couple of ways. The first one is segmenting our workforce. Uh, and the second one is providing the intrinsic value and understanding what compensation, where it plays and where it doesn't play. Um, but fundamentally, if we can put that build on the foundation of the two things that we talked about before, i.e. deliver the basics, deliver competitive compensation, uh, and tell people about it, uh, then we're going to be in good stead. The first thing I'd like to talk about is really segmenting your workforce. Um, fundamentally, I've been talking about employees generally, but we can see two layers, essentially, of differentiation. And the first, obviously, you're working in different sectors. Employees in different sectors tend to value compensation differently. Now, I'm talking about broad generalization here because within each organization, there's, there's other sectors, segments that I'll talk about momentarily. But fund, typically, what we'll see in the financial sector uh, is the social need that I talked about before uh, is a lot more prominent, especially among investment advisors uh, and those that derive a, a, a very high level of variable compensation uh, based on financial performance. Uh, they tend to, var uh, to value that highly, and uh, I'll get into a little bit about you know how to use variable effectively in, in a minute. Not-for-profit, uh, on the other hand, um, it's really the emotional and, to an extent, a, a reverse social need uh, that takes that that that's, uh, that plays here. Um, the not-for-profit are much more uh, tend much more to be rewarded by intrinsic as opposed to ex extrinsic um, values. The the nature of what they do, the nature of the vision of their organization, um, often is more important than the social need uh, to make more money or the functional need to make more money. Public sector values stability. Public sector values um, longevity uh, as opposed to some of the variable or performance-based pay, pay components. Um, one of the issues that the federal government is facing now, we've done a lot of work with the feds, is they instituted performance for pay uh, a number of years ago and they're finding that it's not really making uh, the, uh, having the impact that they wanted to, either on performance or on, on engagement. And fundamental, what, what's going on there, to make a long story short, is it really is counter to the values of most public sector employees, and it doesn't meet the fairness test that I've been talking about before. And industry can be all over the place. 
Um, now, within your sector, in your company, the first thing is obviously employees should be treated equitably, but we can't treat them all the same. Even within our organization, there's going to be certain types of employees and certain job categories that are going to respond differently to different types of compensation. Um, and different skill sets require different programs to motivate and engage. If I'm working uh, in an R&D or scientific-based organization, for example, uh, scientists can be much motivated much more by non-monetary considerations, such as allowing them to do time for pure research, allowing them for public time for publication, things like that. Um, Sales professionals obviously are the longest standing example of uh, the different skill set requiring uh, different tools to motivate and engage. We can't go in always, obviously into the, 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 the details. All I'm telling you at this high level stage is look at your employee uh, workforce um, and even talk to them through a series of focus groups or what have you to understand what motivates and what engages and also understand that first bias I talked to you about, of course, people are going to say, I want more money. That's, that, that goes without saying. Uh, but understand when we're talking about the, the social and emotional needs and the intrinsic factors of recognition, um, fairness and equity and motivation, that really uh, the messages, the tools are at the intrinsic level uh, and less so at the extrinsic level. So how really uh, I started this off really talking about sort of engaging your employees through compensation with the caveat of don't. Um, and really what, we're, what we need to do is look at engagement and look at com the compensation proxy for engagement. The first thing uh, is, is, and the first complaint, and the first reason for employees to leave, um, if compensation is perceived as out of whack, um, it's either a fairness or equity issue, it's a recognition issue, it could be a motivation issue, or uh, it, if, if it's not, if it's genuinely, um, if it's genuinely low, sometimes, uh, as in some not-for-profits, uh, where they can't afford to pay more, it might be a functional issue. Uh, I'm not going to deal with the functional issue now, that's a comp and benefits uh, specialty um, conversation, but I will deal with uh, under the assumption that we're paying a market rate uh, and we're, co we're providing benefits and compensation at a market rate, how do we deal with each of this? Well, first of all, the fairness and equity issue, it's all about transparency. Um, if, if, in fact, we're compensating fairly, we're delivering the basics, as I said before, it's about transparency uh, to a level of comfort that often executives and people who are long in the tooth have difficulty with, uh, communication, redressing imbalances. Um, possibly also through communication. There's many, many conversations that can, that can happen that could just be a matter of explaining in a transparent manner why employee A didn't get as much of a raise as, a point, as, as employee B, uh, or why employee A's job package um, requires less compensation than employee B. It's not always going to work, but it goes a long way. If people fundamentally understand uh, how compensation is determined and perceive it as fair, uh, that's really most of the issue. Secondly, understand when comp is a proxy for recognition. So if really recognition is the issue, then let's recognize public recognition, awards, special projects. Uh, increasingly, we're seeing clients uh, undertake community involvement pro uh, projects, social responsibility. Uh, in one financial services client we're working on right now, it's a huge engagement driver to be uh, to have programs that allow um, employees to uh, to become involved in the community, and that can be recognition for a job well done. That can be recognition for a certain uh, level of performance. Uh, notice the unnoticed. This is management by walking around. This is very very subtle comments. This is just putting stuff on boards really um, posting stuff on intranets, noticing things that go by on a daily basis and recognizing our peers and recognizing our employees. If the employee feels that they're amply recognized for what they're doing, um, then they won't use compensation as a proxy for that recognition. And finally, uh, compensation as motivation. Um, if we're talking, we're trying to motivate our employees, then we should be looking at intrinsic engagement drivers. 
if we're talking about emotional, meeting the emotional needs and the, of the intrinsic motivation. Um, autonomy, especially in knowledge-based roles. If someone, you need to motivate someone to do, uh, to do a better job, to do more job, provide them the values base, provide them the structure, but then let go. Uh, let them do it themselves. And you'll see uh, by doing that and allowing them to have authentic leadership in a certain area of activity, um, then that's going to be very, very highly motivating. And we see especially that that's especially true in the in knowledge-based industries. Learning and growth opportunities. Um, things that are simple, such as lunch and learn, sh job shadowing, um, provide, uh, recognizing that the employee wants to learn and grow, and then providing those opportunities. Yes, you can argue that there is some cost to that, but um, it, if we're, we're going to achieve the same things in terms of motivating our employees, especially when their output is not uh, metrics-based, um, it's, it's, it, uh, it's much more knowledge-based. Um, then learning and growth, and I just put three examples here. There's people can put their heads together and really understand uh, the intrinsic engagement drivers and work towards those as, you, as opposed to using comp and benefits to try to achieve engagement. I promised I would, and now I'm going to come back to variable compensation or performance-based compensation. It can be an effective motivator. It can drive engagement, but only under certain conditions. Uh, the first is it has to be based on a transparent, data-driven, objective metric. Um, sales, um, profitability in some cases, piecework, uh, individual productivity metrics that's objective, that nobody can argue with. Um, the individual influence then is quantifiable or at least readily apparent. So the individual's contribution to that metric or the individual's performance of that metric has to be readily available and transparent. Um, so I, as I said, piecework sales, productivity, profitability for senior managers. The third uh, condition really is the individual uh, has to have direct accountability, control, or substantial influence on achievement of this metric. In other words, if it's not clear who's contributing to profitability, let's say, uh, or who's contributing to, to a specific sale, um, then that you're going to have all kinds of issues in terms of the fair and equity, fairness and equity uh, driver. And then the variable compensation will not only lose effectiveness, it'll actually become counterproductive as employees start to perceive that whatever is happening is unfair. Um, However, when this works, and it does work, and I specifically in, we can point to the financial sector as being a very, very good example of where variable-based compensation is a very important driver of engagement. Um, what happens when, uh, is because compensation is variable, um, engagement then varies. So when the company is having a very, very good year, um, People are making their numbers, people are making their metrics, and they're getting their big bonuses. They tend to be very engaged as well. So compensation is driving that engagement. But when the company has a downturn, now what's happening is engage, does engagement go down with it? Uh, and you have a chicken-egg phenomenon that starts to happen. Is engagement driving business results, or are business results driving engagement? Fundamentally, we want engagement to drive business results, not the other way around. So there is a caveat to the variable compensation component. Uh, in, in, in you might decide that in, among certain employees, in certain if you work in certain sectors, then we need to motivate, and this is the best way to do it, uh, and we'll take the risk that engagement will go down in the off year. Fine, that's that's a fair business decision, but understand that um, that will be the case. And I actually did a presentation not too long ago where that exactly was the case. Uh, engagement went down. Why did it go down? Well, because a very high performance uh, weren't performing as highly in one year for whatever reason. Uh, and then uh, that, their numbers went down and the engagement went right down with it. So, um, When is it counterproductive to engagement? I've already addressed this a little bit, but um, I'm going to say something a little bit controversial and it goes a little bit against the grain in many, in many sectors. Um, first of all, when it's based on subjective performance appraisal or assessment, uh, I think I've already explained why. But team-based compensation, which is um, 
increasingly organizations are looking at compensating teams. Um, but what we're finding is rarely do individual team members contribute equally to a teammate's outcome. So if a team is compensated equally, uh, then again, your fairness uh, emotion kicks in um, and you're actually counterproductive. Uh, you're providing a counterproductive or a counter sway to, uh, to engagement. And we see that. Uh, we see that in our results. Little Dilbert there to, uh, to hammer the point home. So what are we saying with all this? Understand, first of all, uh, take monetary compensation off the table. Primary compensation consideration uh, really is for recruitment and retention of desired talent. After that, it's not about the, the, the numbers anymore, unless, of course, um, that aren't uh, for whatever reason you cannot afford to pay a, a, a market rate for, for for the same job, and that may be an issue in some not-for-profit. We do see that, but then with that uh, with that market or equitable compensation package in place. Deliver the basics, tell your employees where they stand, so be transparent, communicate, and then don't treat all employees equally. Not one compensation package is going to fit all. Uh, segment the workforce um, and, fun, and, and adapt compensation and benefits accordingly. Uh, use intrinsic motivators to address the emotional needs that are met by compensation. So really understand what the, what the emotional drivers are behind compensation understand when it's about fairness, understand when it's about motivation, and understand when it's about recognition. And if we can use proxies, uh, especially for fairness, the communication proxy, recognition, so we can recognize in many other ways and compensation uh, and motivation. Uh, we can do many other things besides compensate to motivate uh, employees and engage them. And in doing so, if the compensation base uh, is in place and it's solid and it's uh, and it's equitable. Then we can build the rest uh, of our engagement um, drivers around it, just like the pyramid that we were talking about before. So fundamentally, engagement work is about OD. It's about organization development. Compensation strategies support or engagement. It shouldn't drive engagement. So we need to uh, deconstruct uh, and then address the intrinsic motivators. So I'm hoping that that's uh, given you a little bit of food for thought in terms of engagement. Um, just a little bit of word in terms of what we're doing next month. One of my favorite topics, work-life balance uh, as a driver of engagement. Uh, and there's a lot, just like compensation, there's a lot going on underneath the surface when you look at our survey results in terms of how, uh, how we can address work-life balance um, uh, as, a, as a driver. Uh, some here are some other upcoming events. Uh, we're going to have quite a busy fall, uh, so I'm hoping we can uh, meet up with uh, some of you at, at one of these things all over the country. I'll be speaking at a uh, conference in, in, in Vancouver in early September. Uh, of course, we just, we're going to do the webinar at the end of August, Work-Life Balance. Um, and then uh, there's, another, there's a series of other uh, things that are taking us through the fall, so hopefully we can meet up with, with some of you there. And with that, uh, I will uh, open the floor to a number of questions. We'll see how we can uh, Norm? address address questions. Yep. It's uh, Sean here. There's just a, a, a just cognitive of everyone's time, but there is a couple of questions that came in. Um, one question we can respond to quickly: If copies of this presentation will be made available? Yes, absolutely. Uh, copies will be made available, and also a copy of the webinar recording will also be made available in a couple of days, uh, probably by mid to late next week. Um, first of all, I want to thank you, Norm. That was a, an excellent presentation on uh, on compensation and, and the fact that there's some underlying currents other than just pay me more that seems to be uh, affecting employee engagement and compensation scores in these surveys. So it's part, as I think, uh, what I pulled out of it is part recognition, it's part around motivation. It's really trying to understand and segment the different workforce uh, aspects to understand what really drives motivation for those individuals. And it's not always about just pay me more. There might be other things that get highlighted there. So, so uh, excellent overview. There was one interesting question, I think we only have time for that, and 
in, it was around unionization, around, yeah. this, un, around this idea of fairness and, and recognition. Uh, how, uh, how do you deal with that in a unionized environment, or what are some of the you know, challenges or opportunities that, uh, that could be done? Because there is more constraints, I think, often within that environment. Actually, the unionized environment is, uh, is it's an interesting one because what happens is the collective agreement actually takes compensation right off the table. So in a way that we need to, uh, in a non-unionized environment, it's not done as, uh, as drastically. So when you have a, comp a competitive, sorry, a collective agreement in place, then the compensation is defined. Uh, the only way to revisit that with unions is to reopen or, or in the next collective bargaining piece. That with notwithstanding, then you still have issues around uh, the individual's employee and, their, and what the messages they're receiving from what their compensation happens to be. Uh, and we can still use the tools that I was talking about. We can definitely use the fairness and equity uh, tool in concert with union leadership, of course. Uh, once there's a collective agreement in place, then it's contingent about, amongst both management and union leadership to do that communication piece, uh, to communicate the fairness and the equity uh, of that compensation. Around recognition, uh, then we still have all of the other tools in place. Of course, it's going to depend on the specifics of any collective agreement, whether the, some of those things will be barred. But it shouldn't. We what we shouldn't do is we shouldn't necessarily use the collective agreement to, to say, okay, well, I can't do anything on recognition, and I can't do anything on. Uh, I'm sorry, you you don't seem to understand that uh, we're not. You know, we're not. We don't value you. Of course, we do. Uh, I don't have the compensation tool, but we can recognize in this, in, in a number of ways, and any one of those programs would work um, in terms of uh, because fundamentally. Uh, unionized, non-unionized employees, uh, emotionally, we're all after the same things. We're all after uh, feeling valued in the organization. So um, just because there's a collective agreement in place, it actually uh, provides us an opportunity to use some of those other tools. Obviously, on the motivation side, uh, we don't have the compensation tools or the variable compensation tools at our disposal for a unionized uh, workforce unless they're spelled out in collective agreement, but we do have the intrinsic motivators uh, in place, uh, and we should, uh, could and should use them um, to help us engage around the compensation, uh, uh, compensation barriers. Thank you, Norm. To contact us, or to learn more, just Google Talent Map, or simply click on the link below.